usually once a year. I find it important to share with you what's been commonly known as the State of the Parish Report, if you will. Um, while I named the pastor, in a very real sense, this is as much your parish as it is my parish. And it's important for you to at least occasionally hear something about how things are going, what's happening, where we've been, where we might be headed. And obviously with a parish the size of ours, there is no way I can touch on everything going on or go into depth about very much at all. And so I'm hoping today to give you sort of a high level sort of look at what's been happening in the parish and what we might be looking at, some of what we're looking at in this year to come. When I ask the staff, what kind of things do you have for me to share with everybody, I have a folder about this thick full of stuff. And I boil it down to these few pages. But even so, this would be a little longer than your normal homily. But so far, everyone has found it very interesting and very important. I've asked people, what can I take out of it? And everyone says, nothing. Leave everything right there. So just to kind of maybe frame the conversation, last year in our parish, 2019, we had 145 households register new in the parish. It's almost exactly the same as 2018, when 144 households registered in the parish. So that's on average. Two to three new households registering in the Catholic community in Pleasanton every week. Right now, we have 5,357 households on the books. That's more than 18,000 individuals. But to be very honest with you, as a staff, we're pretty sure that not all that data is correct. We have an old data processing system that we constantly find mistakes in. Uh, and for example, this year it tells me that so far, I'm sorry, in 2019, it tells me that two families left the parish and two families became inactive. And we know it's a whole lot more than that. It's a whole lot more dynamic happening than that. So one of the things we want to accomplish this year is to find new software that will allow us to work with the information we have. And also we want to set about the task of re-registering the entire parish. Find out who's really here, get current information that we know what we've got and what we're working with. Last year, we welcomed 75 new members of all ages through the sacrament of baptism and through reception into the church. We celebrated first communions for 152 children, confirmed 106 of our youth and 8 adults, celebrated the sacrament of the sick with 577 individuals, and we said goodbye to 61 members of our parish who passed away, including Father Dan Danielson and Father Paul Minahan. As I'm sure you're aware by this point, coming up in just a couple weeks now, on Monday, the 24th of this month, we will mark the one-year anniversary of Father Paul's passing. And on that evening, we will have a memorial mass over at St. Augustine Church, 7 o'clock in the evening. So I hope you will join us that evening, Monday the 24th, as we remember and celebrate the great gift that our previous pastor and our friend was, Father Paul. We also celebrated 17 weddings in our community last year. Now in September, we have the churchical ministry sign-ups all during that month. Uh, we passed out the sign-up sheets, they were available after every mass, and we told you that when it came to liturgical ministries, that is ministries that happened during Sunday Masses, we were hoping to have 1,000 people sign up so that the burden of ministry didn't fall on just a few. So while we hoped for 1,000 people, we ended up with 485. So a little disappointing, less than half of what we were hoping for, but we're very grateful for those 485 people who so faithfully ministered and able to celebrate Masses so well every weekend. Our mass attendance, I would say, between 2018 and 2019, was level. As you're probably aware, every October, the diocese requires every parish in the diocese to count everybody who comes to every mass. And we send that downtown to the diocese, and it gives us some indication of how things are going in the parishes and in the diocese as a whole. We were able to, last October report, that on average here in the Catholic community of Pleasanton, 2,777 people come to Mass on an average weekend. That's exactly 20 people fewer than the year before. So if you're with me, you need to see already some of the issues we have. For example, 145 new households registered, but Mass attendance was down by 20. What's that dynamic? What's happening? 
Even more so, again, to give you the higher level, if you back up to 2015, between 2015 and 2019, according to the numbers that were reported to the diocese, our mass attendance dropped by over 1,200 people. By over 1,200 people. Obviously, that's a concern. The bishop's appeal. Every year, the bishop has this annual appeal that's been going on for decades now. And last year, our goal was $117,500. As a community, we reached 28% of that goal. Honestly, I'm not worried about that. There was a lot of change here in this parish last year. No one to sort of lead the charge on that. Between Father Dan passing, Father Paul passing, uh, Father Kwame leaving, my arriving, Father Lou coming. And in addition to that, the diocese was really late on getting the materials out for the appeal. They sort of missed their window as far as I was concerned. So I'm not really worried about that from last year. However, the bishop's appeal is returning this month. As a matter of fact, this weekend is supposed to be, um, what is it called? Kickoff weekend. Next week is supposed to be education weekend. Then commitment weekend, followed by follow-up weekend. And um, there's even a video of the bishop that I'm supposed to show you at all the masses. No, thank you. None of that. Uh, if we were to do all that, it would be up all those Sundays, it would take us into Lent. And I want us to be looking at the scriptures and preparing ourselves spiritually for that wonderful season of Lent as we had for Easter. So what I'm going to do with this is when it comes to the Bishop's Appeal, I will write about it for you in the bulletin, probably next weekend. When the materials arrive, the brochures and the envelopes and things, we will put those out. We will take the, the collection on the weekend as planned. And my hope is that through your accustomed generosity, that we can do better than we did last year. Um, I'd like to see maybe, I don't know, 70% of goal this year. I think that would be awesome. And if it looks like we're not going to get there, then I will show you the bishop's video. Okay? <laughs> we're all in agreement on that. Um, our staff is amazing. And there are far too many of them to talk about all of them. But I will tell you, when I arrived here, I discovered what I thought were two holes in the staff, two things missing. First, on sort of the administrative side, I was kind of surprised to find that with two large facilities the way that we have, uh, St. Louis Seton here that was built 20 years ago, St. Augustine, that whole campus built in the 1960s, with the desire to maybe build new buildings, that there was no one who sort of oversaw all that. No one who worked with contractors and got bids on things, made sure that things were maintained, all that sort of stuff. And also sort of oversaw the budget as a whole, oversaw the administrative staff. We were missing that. And I'm very happy to say that as of December 1, 2019, we filled that hole. Michael Harmon, who's sitting right here in the front pew filming this to put on our website, who Father Paul hired to be our communications director, um, I'll just say what I've been saying all the other masses, he has a resume that's incredibly impressive and all sorts of skills that we were not taking advantage of. And he was very eager to do this work for us. So I'm very happy to have him in that position. Um, there's been all sorts of things for us to deal with. I mean, I wasn't here but a couple weeks when you know the eaves fell off of the hall, literally. If you were at St. Augustine Church on the fourth Sunday of Advent at the 10 o'clock Mass, one of the lights dropped out of the ceiling and was dangling there. And interestingly enough, today at the 11 o'clock Mass, that light right there fell out of the ceiling. That's why there's a couple of cues uh, that are ripped off that come to sit there. So there's obviously things that, Michael, you have job security. We'll just put it that way. <laughs> Plenty of work to do. The other hole in the staff was someone to essentially do the same kind of thing, but on the pastoral side of the house. We have amazing staff members, as I say, but everyone is sort of pigeonholed. You know, our faith formation people do their faith formation. There's no one who, if someone came to me and said, Father, you're the greatest, most amazing ministry in the world, I've got no one whose job it is, is to develop new ministries. To take the new ministry, recruit people for it, train people for it, launch the new ministry, and then supervise the ministries. We don't have that. I'm hoping to have that in place, the person for that in place, by the middle of the year, maybe July 1. I will let you know that the single biggest request I have in this community in the last eight months is, Father, can we do Bible study? And I think, yes, all in favor of Bible study, let's go for it. So um, those of you who know her, Aggie Burke will be returning as part of staff to lead us in Bible study. We're trying to find a start date for that, probably the first Thursday, Friday, in the first week of Lent coming up with that. 
Our high school youth ministry program consistently has about 30 participants, and it took a little bit of scheduling magic, but we managed to take room eight at the hall over at St. Augustine and schedule that exclusively for our youth. It is their youth room now. They have a place where they belong, where they can come, where they can hang out, they can watch movies, they can uh, play video games, they can just be together, they can do their homework, they can have their sessions there. They've repainted that room, they've refloored that room, they've got a refrigerator, a microwave. I think they're looking for a gaming system, but it's their room, and I, they're very excited to have it, and that we do that for them. Our middle school youth ministry consistently has 80 to 100 participants. Confirmation right now has 114 youth preparing for confirmation in 2021, and something like 102 will be confirmed this year in May. We'll also have 86 First Communions in May. In our elementary school faith formation program, we have 450 families with a total of 640 children in elementary school faith formation. Those are great numbers. But again, to give you the larger picture, if you just step back 10 years to 2010, we had over 820 families and 1,400 children. So enrollment in faith formation has dropped by about 55%. Again, that's a concern. We're not passing the faith on to our children. But of course, they've got a lot going on. They just had, a couple weeks ago, their third annual disco bingo, which was a ball. Uh, family movie nights, retreats, lock-ins, vacation Bible school. 260 children in vacation Bible school last June. We'll be doing that again this June. And we have so many other ministries. On that ministry sign-up sheet I referred to, I counted at least 45 different ministries. And so much good happening. In CYO, we have 56 basketball teams with over 550 players and 108 volunteer coaches. Uh, track and field begins this month. We've got 60 athletes in that. Uh, we have over 200 parishioners in small Christian communities. 200 of our parishioners who meet about weekly to pray with each other, to look at the readings with each other, to share their faith journeys together. As a matter of fact, with Lent approaching, they're going to open that up. We're going to have small Christian community sign-ups for the five weeks of Lent so that you can all participate in that opportunity to come together with fellow parishioners and look at, during Lent, the topic of week prayer. I really encourage you, once a week for about 90 minutes, to maybe do that as your Lenten practice this year in preparation for Easter. Um, I think you'll find it to be very enriching to your faith life. Just take that to prayer for yourself. We reach out to those in need in amazing ways. Our first read day says, if you feed the hungry, your light will shine, your wounds will be healed. It's amazing what this community does. Our sponsoring, the Get on the Bus program each spring, supports eight buses of kids that get to visit their parents in 13 California correctional facilities. Our Giving Tree program last year provided for 395 families, over 1,800 people. That's your generosity that makes that happen. We had 150 volunteers from here working on that. Our St. Vincent Paul program has 25 members divided into seven teams who last year made 105 home visits and provided assistance to Pleasanton residents in the form of food, utility payments, rent, or temporary housing to more than 360 individuals. Our Social Justice Committee has helped us make tangible changes to many thousands of families, both in the United States and internationally, right? We work with Habitat for Humanity, building homes locally. We work with Kids Against Hunger. We packed over 25,000 emergency meals to feed hungry children in the Philippines and these six other social justice programs. The Knights of Columbus saw to it that 87 families received Thanksgiving baskets and more than $45,000 was given out to worthy charities. Um, do the toy drive for Santa Rita, and so much more. Thank you. Without your generosity, all those people in need would have gone without us. We make an amazing difference in so many people's lives. Now, I don't want this state of parish thing to be a finance report. It's, there's so much more than that to this community. And yet, for good or for ill, in this culture, it takes money, resources, to do ministry. We have to do things like pay our amazing staff and keep the lights on and things of that nature. But also, you have a right to know how we are using the money that you entrust to our care. We need to be transparent and good stewards with that. So, to round some numbers up for you, at the end of last year, in our parish checking, we had about $350,000. In parish savings, about $288,000. 
which sounds like a lot of money, but as I shared with you in the bulletin, this entire skylight of this building needs to be replaced come this spring. And that costs us anywhere between six hundred and seven hundred thousand dollars. The Rise and Build campaign is still going on. Um, as of the end of last year, it had about two point four million dollars in it, and I'm aware there's another two and a half million from previous capital campaigns. A moment with capital campaigns. When I was here twenty years ago, as a as an assistant priest, um, and this building was being built, actually, there was a capital campaign to build this building, and I've become aware that almost every year since then, there's been a capital campaign of some kind going on. That's not tenable. We need to figure out how to end that. We need an end game for our capital campaigns. Some way to bring that to a logical conclusion. So we're working that out. When, when, when these pledges are, are done and over, that should be in my hope to not have a capital campaign during my tenure here. That's just been too much capital campaign for too much time. 2019 ended well. It looks like we're in the black to the tune of about $126,000. But 90,000 of that has come from the Carpenters Union. You may not know this, but, but across Reed Drive, just right out there, there's a Carpenters Union, Carpenters Training Union, and they're building a new building. So while they're building a new building, they've been leasing our parking lot during the week to park their cars. So if you come in the back entrance there, and you see the sign for apprentice carpenter training, that's not because we're all apprentices of Jesus the carpenter. That's because the carpenters are actually parking here. And they paid us $90,000 for that. Next year, we, we look like we'll be in the black, I'm sorry, this year, 2020, to the tune of about $20,000. And again, that's because the carpenters were paid us about $90,000. Otherwise, it wouldn't be looking quite so good. So besides things like non-regular sources, like the Carpenters Union, where does our money come from? Well, it doesn't come from the government, and it doesn't come from the diocese. It actually goes to those places. Some of our money comes from uh, fees for programs, like when people register for faith formation. But the number one source of our income is, of course, the Sunday play collection, when that basket goes around the first time. Last year, our plate collection for 2019 was just over $1.8 million. Thank you very much. That's your generosity that makes that happen. The fourth quarter last year was our best quarter. But again, to give you the high level view, in the last 10 years, last year's plate collection was the lowest we've had in 10 years. And of course, the cost of doing business goes up every year. So that's a challenge for us. Um, and so I need to, in my role as pastor, ask you to prayerfully consider all the financial responsibilities you have in your life and to increase your giving to the church if you can. If you can. I know the biblical precedent is 10%, right? And some people say 5% to the church, 5% to other worthy uh, societies or, or, or organizations, and that's cool. Whatever you prayerfully decide, whether it's 1% or 2%, as long as you've made a deliberate prayerful decision about what you can tithe. And here's my promise to you. I don't believe that God asks us to tithe so that we go out on a limb for Him so He can push us off. That is to say, He doesn't ask us to tithe to put us in a tight situation. So, if you tithe to this community, and you do so in a way that's trackable by electronic fund transfer, by check, by envelope, my promise to you is this, that if you have an unforeseen emergency this year, you lose a job, there's sudden medical bills, something like that happens, come see me, and I will give you back every single penny you've given to the church. And I probably have ways to help you with additional funds or additional things. Like I say, I don't think God asks us to tithe so that we then end up in a desperate situation. Matter of fact, most people I know, including myself, who give away 10%, we don't even miss it. We don't even miss it. Um, I'm aware of time, but a few other quick things for you that you need to know about. Coming up in less than three weeks, on um, Leap Day, on the 29th of this month, I will be gathering with our parish staff, our pastoral council, our finance council, and our capital campaign committee. We have someone coming in to help us begin the process of missioning and visioning for our community. 
The missions, the visions that were set for our community 10 or 20 years ago, I don't think really work anymore and really apply for us. Pleasant of this change, the community has changed, and we need to respond to that change. And as I say, with attendance down, with enrollment in programs down, with liturgical ministries down, with plate collection down, and buildings literally falling down around us, we can't act like everything's okie dokie. We need to look at those issues and address them. Um, how is it that we want to be, to borrow a phrase from the gospel, salt for the earth, light for the earth, light, salt for the tri valley? How are we as a community going to do that? What does God call us to do? I know God well enough to know this, that God pays for what he orders. And if we can figure out what God wants us to do, all the resources we need will be there for that. In the meantime, this is our moment to think outside the box. Who do we want to be? What do we want to look like? Uh, after I gave this last week over at St. Augustine, one of our youth was confirmed last year, came to me and said, we need food trucks after Mass. Awesome. I love the thinking outside the box. I mean, if you think it would work for us to have a fleet of dirigibles that shuttle people back and forth between the two campuses, I want to know that. And I want to know why, but I want to know that. I love the outside the box thinking. And this is our moment to dream and to dream big. Some of the things that have been floated past me, no decisions made on anything, but some things to be considered. Some people have said, when it comes to the Rise and Build campaign, we need to do everything that was promised. We need to find money somewhere, probably by sunny land, and do everything that was promised. Fixed up all our buildings and build our new building, or at least a variation on that. We should do everything. Another option, we should, this has been around for 20 years, divide into two separate parishes and operate independently. Another option, consolidate to one location. Mass attendance is less now than it was when this church was built. Let's consolidate, save some money, and build our community that way. Fourth one, again, outside the box, Sell both places. Sell everything we have and build in some place new everything we need. Again, outside the box, big thinking, but this is the moment for it. This is the moment for it. And whatever we come up with, whatever the leadership of the community comes up with, there will be town hall meetings. So that everyone who's interested has a chance to hear what we're thinking, have your input, let us see your ideas, and we'll try to adjust things. I know that eventually, when we make a decision, whatever we do, there will be people who will be unhappy. I get that, goes along with the territory of leadership, right? However, I do think the one option we do not have is to do nothing. We can't do nothing. In another 10 or 20 years, that would be disastrous for us, and we have to avoid that. So I have to end with a couple of challenges for all of us. The first is, for every single one of you, to remind you of what I've been asking you for since Adam was here. Ten minutes of daily prayer, every single one of us. Maybe you can see why your community now needs your prayer, as well as just spending that quiet time with God alone, and having someone who checks in with you to hold you responsible for that. The second challenge is hospitality. Hospitality. Survey after survey after study after survey shows people choose a parish for three reasons. The homilies, the music, and the hospitality. The homilies and the music, we're working on it. But the hospitality, that's you guys. I can stand here every Sunday and say to everyone, you're always welcome at the Catholic community of Pleasanton. But the reality of that is experienced right there in the pews where you are. Our hospitality ministers are incredibly important. The people who meet you at the door and give you a worship aid. And it's sort of tragic that none of our masses we have enough hospitality ministers. For those of you who slipped in by those side doors today, there was no one there to meet you, no one there to give you a worship name. There is no reason why anybody should enter this church on a Sunday without someone saying, welcome, we're glad you're here, thank you for coming, are you visiting? And there is no reason why when you leave today, there shouldn't be someone there to say, thank you for being here, here's a bulletin, we hope to see you next week. So important, and we don't have that. But then, there are your pews. Each and every one of you need to consider yourself a hospitality minister. If there are people sitting around you or across from you who you see every week whose name you don't know, introduce yourself. That's the challenge. Every week, meet one new person. 
Are you new? Are you visiting? How long have you been here? Is there something I can pray for you with at this Mass? Be hospitable to one another. It makes all the difference in the world whether someone leaves or returns here. It's huge. Uh, in the vestibule, I've put four handouts for you if you would like to have one. One is a financial statement, summary financial statement of last year and our budget for this year. Again, you are entitled to that information, absolutely. Another one is a report from our social justice committee on the work they've done. Then the other two forms, well, all these things I told you that we're having issues with, attendance down, enrollment programs down, et cetera, et cetera, two of those things we can fix tonight if we want to. Two of those things can disappear overnight. And that is, if we, the active members of this community, decide to exercise the stewardship of our time, our treasure, and our talent differently than we have so far, the challenge of liturgical ministers and plate collection being down could disappear immediately, could just be done. So, the other two forms on that table, the liturgical ministry sign up forms. If you're going to be here on Sunday for Mass anyway, why not minister once a month to your brothers and sisters? And the other one is the electronic fund transfer form to sign up for that. And I can't tell you the difference it makes in our budgeting. It's safe, it's easy, it's secure, all those wonderful things. So please check those out. I started this month as the eighth month as your new pastor. Um, do I miss St. Charles, the parish I was previously at? Absolutely. I've missed every parish that I've ever had to leave, including this one. As a matter of fact, when I was here 20 years ago, I remember telling people, if the diocese just left me here for the rest of my priesthood, I'd be very happy. And it looks like that is going to happen now. <laughs> um, Pleasanton is feeling more and more like home once again, every single day. M much of that due to your very warm welcome and support and encouragement. I appreciate that. God agrees. Um, we can talk a lot about what this parish was like 20 years ago. No point to that. That was then, this is now. What I do know is my past has been very blessed, my present is very blessed, and I expect the same going forward. I'm looking forward to a year from now, standing here and telling you what has happened, how God has moved in the 12 months between now and February of 2021. I started by letting you know that I felt you needed to know something about your parish and now you know. Please keep us all in prayer as together we discern where God is leading us to be salt and light in the triad.